Shalom, this is Onia. We're going to be going through the Genesis Apocryphon today. And uh, as I was explaining in other teachings, basically the Genesis Apocryphon was found in the, in the first cave of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And it was fragmentary. The, the beginning and ending were not preserved. But what was preserved is enough to prove to us that if this is in fact, uh, these are authentic writings, then they're actually the source text of the Book of Jubilees and the Book of Genesis. And that's significant for textual criticism and understanding of the Torah itself because uh, it shows us that the Torah uh, comes from other writings and it's dependent on other writings. And I think that is a, has some major implications for our faith. So I'm going to start with the Abraham section of the Genesis Apocryphon. Basically, there were three different books that were found in this scroll. And uh, for example, after the Lamech section ends, it, you then see a line that says, a copy of the book of the words of Noah. And then it goes right into the Noah. So f from that indication, that tells me that these were three different books copied on the same scroll. We, we, we see that like with the Law of Moses, five different books, sometimes they're on the same scroll. And we also see the same thing with the, the 12 prophets, which sometimes are called by Protestants the Minor Prophets. And these are were often included in the same scroll in the Hebrew copies of the Tanakh. And so it's the same thing here. It's three different books, but they're being included in the same scroll. So I'm going to start with the Abraham section. The beginning portion of the Abraham book uh, is not preserved, but here's where it starts. It starts out saying, I called there on the name of God, and I said, you are God. Some words missing here, and then it picks up and king of eternity, or king of the ages. We see that phrase in Enoch as well. And it continues saying, And he spoke with me in the night. Like a word or two missing here. And it says, And take strength to wander. Up to now you have not reached the holy mountain. So I set out to go there. I was going to the south of Mora. Like a word missing here then. says, I went until I reached Hebron. Now I built Hebron for that region, and I lived there for two years. That chronological detail is found elsewhere only in Jubilees. And then it continues saying, Now there was a famine in all the land, all of this land, but I heard that there was wheat in Egypt. So I set out to go, some words missing here, to the land that is in Egypt. And then there are some more words missing here. And then it says, And there was something missing here. Then it says, The Carmen River, one of the heads of the river. I said, Enter. Uh, it breaks off here again. It, at the beginning of this section, it's very uh, fragmentary, but then it, shortly after, it's going to start getting into like uh, full text where there's not really any breaks. So it continues saying, now we have been within our land. So I crossed over the seven heads of this river, which afterwards enters into the great sea of salt. After this, I said, Now we have left our land and entered the land of the sons of Ham, the land of Egypt. Now I, Abram, dreamt a dream in the night of my entry into Egypt. I saw in my dream that there was a single cedar and a single date <coughs> palm, a single date palm, having sprouted together from one root. And men came seeking to cut down and uproot the cedar, thereby leaving the date palm by itself. But the date palm cried out and said, Do not cut down the cedar, for the two of us are sprung from one root. So the cedar was left on account of the date palm, and they did not cut me down. Uh, that, that seems like a scribal error, because he says he did not cut me down, but he's explaining the dream. So that could be either a scribal error or a translation error. Then he says, <coughs> he says, Then I awoke in the night from my sleep, and I said to my wife Sarai, I dreamt a dream. On account of this dream I am afraid. She said to me, 
Tell me your dream so that I may know. Excuse me. <coughs> so I began to tell her this dream, and I said to her, some words missing, this dream, again, some words missing, that they will seek to kill me, but to spare you. Therefore, this is the entire kind deed that you must do for me. In all cities that we will enter, say of me, he is my brother. I will live under your protection, and my life will be spared because of you. Some words are missing again, and it says, They will seek to take you away from me, and to kill me. Sarai wept because of my words that night. So, uh, like a couple words missing here, then it says, When we entered into the district of Egypt, and then on the next line it says, And Pharaoh Zoan, now, the way they're translating this is Pharaoh Zoan, they're translating it as a name, but if I understand correctly, it could also be understood as Pharaoh of Zoan. Uh, so if it was the actual name of the Pharaoh, that would be highly significant, but I'm not convinced it is. It may just be Pharaoh of Zoan. Then it says, Sarai to turn towards Zoan. The next line, she worried herself greatly that no man should see her five years. Now at the end of those five years, skip some lines. Uh, I mean, not lines, it skips some words and then continues. And before I say that, that detail of the five years, it's not in Genesis, but it is in Jubilees as well. Uh, then it says, To me, and three men from the nobles of Egypt. Uh, then it says, By Pharaoh Zoan, because of my words and my wisdom. And they were giving me, then continues, they asked scribal knowledge and wisdom and truth for themselves. So I read before them the book of the words of Enoch. Which is interesting. Mm -hmm. He had the book of Enoch. He's reading from wisdom. And it's interesting to see that some of the Egyptian concepts are connected to the Bible. So could it possibly be that some of these concepts actually came from uh, Enoch, Noah, that very well may be the source. Uh, and e the Egyptians followed a calendar of 360 days, which is what Enoch also teaches. So uh, that may be ultimately the source of Egypt's calendar. So uh, that's just a very interesting detail. And then it says in the next, it skips some more, uh, some more words and then says, in the womb in which he had grown, they were not going to get up until I would clearly expound for them some words missing. The words of, it probably said Enoch. And then the next line, with much eating and much drinking. It mentions some wine, and I'm going to skip a couple lines. And then it says, uh, let's see, it mentions the words of Enoch in line 29 of this column. So Enoch is featuring heavily here. And then after this, there's like six lines completely missing. But then it picks up in the next column and says it's in the middle of a, uh, a praise of the Egyptians of Sarah or Sarai. Remember in Genesis it says they praised her beauty and because basically she was, they thought she was like the most beautiful. So it says, how irresistible and beautiful is the image of her face, how lovely her forehead and soft the hair of her head. How graceful are her eyes, and how precious her nose. Every feature of her face is radiating beauty. How lovely is her breast, and how beautiful her white complexion. As for her arms, how beautiful they are, and her hands, how perfect they are. Every view of her hands is stimulating. How graceful are her palms, and how long and thin all the fingers of her hands. Her legs are of such beauty, and her thighs so perfectly apportioned. There is not a virgin or bride who enters the bridal chamber more beautiful than she. Her beauty surpasses that of all women, since the height of her beauty soars above them all. And alongside all this beauty she possesses great wisdom. Everything about her is lovely. Now when the king heard the words of Hyrcanos and his two companions, that the three of them spoke as one, he greatly desired her and sent someone to be quick in acquiring her. When he saw her, he was dumbfounded at all of her beauty, and took her for himself as a wife. He also sought to kill me, 
But Sarai said to the king, He is my brother, so that I would benefit on, her, on account of her. Thus I, Abram, was spared because of her and was not killed. I'll stop there for a second. That's a very different version of the story that Genesis is telling us. Or Genesis doesn't actually say a different version of the story, but it's the way it words it. People read into it. They interpret it in a way that basically they think that Abraham is being unfaithful. He's being unrighteous. And it makes it seem like Abraham's, like, for some strange reason, it doesn't tell us why, but just all of a sudden he thinks, oh, they're going to want to kill me because they they're going to want to be with you. Isn't that kind of like almost like a little bit like uh, self-conceited or something? If like, it's like, uh, everyone, everyone's going to want to kill me because you're so amazing. Like, you know, it doesn't seem to really make sense. But with the context of the, the book of Abraham, we're basically being told that he was giving a prophetic dream by the creator of what he's supposed to do. So he wasn't being unfaithful. And then secondly, he was told that they were going to try to kill him. And then not only this, Abraham's telling us that Pharaoh desired to kill him. It wasn't just, he might try to kill me. He, he was going to. So this was definitely going to happen unless this uh, deception was being done. And as Abraham does explain later in Genesis, he, they technically were related uh, siblings, just not full-blood siblings. Anyways, just much more to this story. Another thing that's interesting is in Genesis, it actually, later on in one of the chapters, it actually has Abraham explaining to the Pharaoh why he did this. And, he, and Abraham quotes a conversation he has with his wife. He said, I, I said to my wife, this is the righteousness that you will do to me in all the cities. But that conversation is not found in Genesis. <coughs> In, in the narrative where he, uh, before all that happened. It's just basically say, having Abraham say, oh yeah, I, I, told, I said this to my wife, but nowhere does it corroborate that in Genesis. But we see that corroboration in the book of Abraham. So that's just, uh, it's showing that we're missing a lot to the story. And, but you can see why either Moses himself, if he's the author of Genesis, or the scribes who may have removed extra portions of Genesis, you can see why they might remove some of these details, like the, the praise of how amazingly attractive Sarai was. That's explicit detail of you know, erotic content, essentially, and you don't necessarily need to know that. You basically just need to know they praised her beauty, her beauty so much that the Pharaoh strongly desired to be with her. So you could easily see why that would be removed as unnecessary. And then you can see why they might remove the conversation that they had if the conversation was alluded to later on. So you can see why the scribes, uh, how the scribes work and how they might easily condense the storyline to preserve the basic narrative, but just make it simpler. Because uh, if Genesis you know, is written by Moses, he basically had to take multiple different books and condense them to produce a book form of the entire story. Otherwise, what's the point of writing Genesis? If it's just going to be word for word, basically everything else that those other books say, then he doesn't really need to write it. He, he would just give them the copies of those books. It seems to me that he wrote Genesis as this is the, this is the short version of the story. If you don't have time to read all this other stuff, Here's what you need to know. This is the, the main points. Uh, so I believe that's why Genesis was written, to give us the, the, the short version. It's sort of like the, uh, the Spark Notes version. Let's see. Well, I don't need that. My bad. Uh, so now I'm going to continue from where I left off. So it says, I, Abram, wept bitterly. I and Lot, my brother's son, with me on the night when Sarai was taken from me by force. That night I prayed and entreated and asked for mercy. Through sorrow and streaming tears, I said, Blessed are you, Most High God, my Lord, for all ages, for you are Lord and ruler over everything. You are sovereign over all the kings of the earth, having power to enact judgment on all of them. So now I lodge my complaint before you, my Lord, concerning Pharaoh Zoan, king of Egypt, for my wife has been taken from me forcefully. Bring judgment against him on my behalf and reveal your mighty hand 
through him and all of his house, that he might not prevail this night in rendering my wife unclean for me. Thus they will come to know you, my Lord, that you are Lord over all the kings of the earth. So I wept and was deeply troubled. During that night the Most High God sent a pestilential spirit to afflict him and to every person of his household an evil spirit. It was an ongoing affliction for him and every person of his household so that he was not able to approach her, nor did he have sexual relations with her. She was with him for two years. That's also a detail that Jubilee says and Genesis does not. Uh, uh, yeah, the generator was struggling. And at the end of two years, the afflictions and hardships grew heavier and more powerful over him and every person of his household. So he sent a message to all the wise men of Egypt and to all the magicians, in addition to all the physicians of Egypt, if they could heal him and the people of his household of this affliction. But all of the physicians and magicians and all of the wise men were not able to succeed in curing him, for the spirit began afflicting all of them, so that they fled the scene. At this point, Hyrcanosh came to me, asking that I come pray over the king and lay my hands upon him, so that he would live. This, is, this was because he had seen me in a dream. Like a word or two is missing here. Then says, But Lot said to him, Abram, my uncle, cannot pray over the king while his wife Sarai is with him. Now go and tell the king that he should send his wife away from himself to her husband. Then he will pray over him so that he might live. I'll stop for a second. To me, that's a lesson that I see of if someone's still in their sin, you shouldn't be praying blessings over them. Well, you know, the Messiah says, uh, uh, bless those who curse you. But I think those are in different ways, uh, different meanings of what that means. Like, bless those who curse you. I think that just means uh, do not, like, wish the worst for them. Want, desire the best for these people. Uh, don't hate them with your whole heart. Uh, just hate the evil parts of them. But in, in this case, we're seeing uh, that... Abraham could, is not allowed to pray uh, for Pharaoh until he writes his wrong. So there's this idea that he's not going to... The, the Old Testament and the New Testament says that the prayers of certain sinners are not heard because they're in rebellion. And he's not going to answer the prayers of a conceited uh, and arrogant heart. So uh, that's, I think it's an important lesson for us because sometimes... Like, you know, the, the, the Christian church tries to make us say that we should forgive everyone, even if they don't ask for forgiveness or they haven't, uh, they, they are not repenting for their sins. And I don't believe that's what the scriptures teach. The Gospel of Luke says, uh, if your brother asks you to, to repent, then forgive him. It wouldn't say that if you're supposed to forgive them no matter what. Uh, so that, I don't know, that's just the application there. Because uh, Jesse, the, Jesse the other day asked me about the Temple Scroll and he was saying, uh, like, some of this information, it's interesting, but what's the application or what's the relevance for my life? So I, I can see things like this, details like this, I see as application. So that's an example there. Let's see. Now it says, continuing, Now when Hyrcanosh heard the words of Lot, he went saying to the king, all these afflictions and hardships that are afflicting and troubling my lord the king are due to Sarai, the wife of Abram. Just return Sarai to Abram, her husband, and this affliction and the spirit of foulness will depart from you. I see you, Governor. Thanks yep. for yep, participating. Uh, so the king called me and said to me, What have you done to me? Why were you saying to me she is my sister when she was your wife, so that I took her as a wife for myself? Here is your wife. Take her, go, and get yourself out of every district of Egypt. But now pray over me and my household that this evil spirit may be driven away from us. So I prayed over him that I might heal him, and I laid my hands upon his head. Then the affliction was removed from him, and the evil spirit driven away from him. Uh, I just want to say one thing. I've always thought the whole thing strange where, uh, like, it just shows that the society did not, in, in those ancient times, did not have a very high value towards women. And I, and I think this particular value 
was wrong. I, I you know, so, you know, some people say the the patriarchal system is the right system, and I and I do believe that, but I think it can easily be abused to uh, something where women's I believe women have rights and they should not be violated, and I think this is an example of a violation of Sarai's rights because. Um, the, the, the Pharaoh basically didn't ask for if Sarai wanted to be uh, with him. He basically just assumed, you know, I can have what I want. And uh, uh, took, took her forcefully to be his wife. So that just shows a, a horrible uh, per view of women at that time. And I don't think that is righteous in any way. See. Now continuing, the king recovered, rose up, and gave to me on that day many gifts. And the king swore to me by an oath that he did not have sexual relations with her, nor did he defile her. Then he returned Sarai to me, and the king gave to her much silver and gold, and much clothing of fine linen and purple. Which uh, some words are missing here, and continues before her, as well as Hagar. Thus he restored her to me and appointed me for me a man who would escort me from Egypt to, and continues, it says, to your people, to you, it breaks off there. So that's probably a conversation that the Pharaoh was having. Uh, then it continues and says, Now I, Abram, grew tremendously in many flocks and also in silver and gold. I went up from Egypt and my brother's son Lot went with me. Lot had also acquired for himself many flocks and took a wife for himself from the daughters of Egypt. I was encamping with him every place of my encampments until I reached Bethel, the place where I had built the altar. I built it a second time, like a couple of words missing here, and offered upon it burnt offerings and a meal offering to the Most High God. And I called there on the name of the Lord of the ages. I praised the name of God, blessed God, and gave thanks there before God because of all the flocks and good things that he had given to me, and because he had worked good on my behalf and returned me to this land in peace. After this day, Lot parted from me due to the, due to the behavior of our shepherds. He went and settled in the Jordan Valley along with all his flocks, and I also added a great deal to his belongings. As he was pasturing his flocks, he reached Sodom and bought a house for himself in Sodom. He lived in it while I was living on the mountain of Bethel, and it was disturbing to me that Lot, my brother's son, had departed from me. Now, stop there for a second. In Genesis' account, there's a longer, like, there's a conversation that he has with, with Lot. That conversation is not here in Genesis Apocrypha. So the scholars, when they see that, they're, they claim that the Genesis Apocrypha was omitting stuff from Genesis. Because they think Genesis came first and the Genesis Apocryphon was modeled off of Genesis. However, what I discovered, this was, this was my theory, and it was corroborated afterwards when I saw in Jubilees, later on, it actually says something like, and Abraham remembered the words that Lot spoke with him on that day. Like it, like it, it uh, looks back at a later, at a later place in, in the Jubilee story after this event. It has him looking back and remembering uh, the conversation he had with Lot. So I believe that this is the key to what, why Genesis Apocryphon uh, does not mention it here. It's because it would have been mentioned later on in Genesis Apocryphon when he's looking back and remembering the conversation he had, just like Jubilees is talking about. Unfortunately, uh, as I said, it, uh, the scroll breaks off at a certain point and the rest of it's missing. So there's no way to corroborate that, but because of the close correspondence between Jubilees and Genesis Apocryphon, I believe it's a solid theory that's almost certainly to be the case. Now let's see. Then God appeared to me in a vision in the night and said to me, Go up to Ramat Hazor, which is to the north of Bethel, the place where you are living. Lift up your eyes and look to the east, to the west, to the south, and to the north, and see this entire land that I am giving to you and to your descendants for all ages. So on the following day I went up to Ramat Hazor, and I saw the land from this high point, from the river of Egypt up to Lebanon and Samir, and from the great sea to Haran, or 
Horan, and all the land of Gibo up to Kadesh, and the entire great desert, that is, east of Horan and Sanir, up to the Euphrates. He said to me, To your descendants I will give all of this land, and they will inherit it for all ages. I will make your descendants as numerous as the dust of the earth, which no one is able to reckon. So too will your descendants be beyond reckoning. Get up, walk around, go and see how great are its length and its width. For I shall give it to you and to your descendants after you unto all the ages. So I, Abram, embarked to hike around and look at the land. I began to travel the circuit from the Gihon River and came alongside the sea until I reached Mount Taurus. I then traversed from along this great sea of salt and went alongside Mount Taurus to the east, through the breadth of the land, until I reached the Euphrates River. I journeyed along the Euphrates until I reached the Erythrean Sea to the east, and was traveling along the Erythrean Sea until I reached the Gulf of the Red Sea, which extends out from the Erythrean Sea. I went around to the south until I reached the Gihon River, and I then returned, arriving at my house in safety. I found all of my people safe, and went and settled at the Oaks of Mamre, which are near Hebron, to the northeast of Hebron. I built an altar there, and offered upon it a burnt offering and a meal offering to the Most High God. I ate and drank there, I and every person of my household. I also sent an invitation to Mamre, Arnem, and Eshkol, three Amorite brothers, my friends, and they ate and drank together with me. Um, just to point out that like, it gives tons of uh, great prolonged details of the geography. And there's actually a important reason for this, and that is in the Book of Jubilees and in the fragments of Book of Noah that were found in Genesis Apocryphon, basically tells us that Noah divided the land between his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And then also the land was divided between uh, their children. And this was a law that these, these descendants, the land was be, to be theirs forever, and that if people violated that, uh, they would be cursed. And we, and we see later in the, uh, in, Genesis, uh, in, in, the book of, in the book of Noah, as well as book of Jubilees, we see that Canaan violated this, uh, this oath and went into the land of Canaan. And that's why the land was called Canaan, because he forcibly took it in violation of the oath. And that's why they were allowed to basically forcibly remove them from the land because they had no right to be there. It was always, the land was always belonging to the descendants of Shem. That's the version of the story that Jubilees and Genesis Apocryphon is telling us. Whereas when we see in Genesis, it makes it look like that the Israelites are just taking it for themselves, uh, which seems to be not an uh, acceptable thing for them so to do. I know 400 years before he kind of exerts his will on them, is he like, given them time to pack up and get out? Or is that just how he designed his covenant with Abraham? I think it could be both ways. Like I think uh, uh, he was giving them time because it does say, I think it says in that passage that you're talking about, it says, because the sins of them were not filled up. So it does indicate that they had a time to repent and, and change from their sins. Um, but so again, these are details which you could easily see why people might not be as much interested in all that ge uh, geography, especially if we don't live in the land of Israel. What's the relevance to us in America when we're not even there? Uh, See, that geography, though, it gives you a background. It gives you an understanding of why they had to go back to Canaan, because that's where that's their land. Right, exactly. And the, where they were going, like he mentioned each place, that's telling you like the borders. He's walking along the borders of the land that was given to him. But so basically you can see why uh, people would find it not very interesting information. You could understand and you could see why scribes might remove some of that information because it's hard for many people to follow along. It's the same thing with the genealogies. Uh, people have a hard time with appreciating the genealogies. Most of the time Christians are going to just skip over those passages. And they'll skip over the laws of Leviticus, chapter, especially chapters 1 to 10, of all the sacrifices. They'll just skip it over because it's pointless to them. They don't, they don't care about it. Now, here's something strange. At this point in the Genesis Apocryphon, this book of Noah, 
I mean, excuse me, book of Abraham, it transitions from first person to third person. It's a little confusing why that is. Scholars speculate why that might be. It could be a linguistic device. Uh, sometimes people refer to themselves in the third person even today. Uh, it could also be like we, in the book of Daniel. Sometimes Daniel's referring to himself in the first person. Other times I'm pretty sure uh, it's third person. So there's parallel there. So uh, I think the reason for that is because what it says is before these days, this and this event happened. So he's like, he's kind of now he's removing himself from the situation and he's describing the history of it. So when you're, if you're writing a history book and you're writing about yourself in a history book for like a, a, a school or something, you're not going to write about yourself in the first person. So in this context, it seems like he's removing himself and like is now approaching it more from a broad history perspective rather than from a personal perspective. So that's why I think it changes from first person to third person at this juncture. So now it continues and says, Before these days, Hedar, Lo, excuse me, Hedar Leomer, the king of Elam, Amraphel, the king of Babylon, Arioch, the king of Cappadocia, Tyrell, the king of Goim, which is Mesopotamia, came and waged war with Bera, the king of Sodom, and with Bersha, the king of Gomorrah, and with Shinab, the king of Adma, and with Shemiabad, the king of Zeboim, and with the king of Bela. All of these banded together for, for battle at the valley of Sedim. The king of Elam and, or Elam, and the kings who were with him overpowered the king of Sodom and all of his allies, and they imposed a tribute on them. For twelve years they were paying their tributes to the king of Elam, but during the thirteenth year they rebelled against him, so that in the fourteenth year the king of Elam gathered together all of his allies. They went up the way of the desert, destroying and plundering from the Euphrates River. They destroyed the Rephaim who were in Ashtara of Karnaim, the Zumzamim who were in Amman, the Amim who were in Shava Hakarioth, and the Hurrians, who were in the mountains of Gibo, until they reached El Paran, which is in the desert. They then turned back and destroyed Ain Dina, there's some words missing here now, and then continues, which is in Hazazon Tamar. Now the king of Sodom went out to meet them along with the king of Gomorrah, the king of Adma, the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela. They engaged the battle in the valley of Sidim against Hedar Leomer and the kings who were with him. But the king of Sodom was crushed and fled, while the king of Gomorrah fell, and many from all, some words missing here, then says, the king of Elam plundered all the goods of Sodom and of Gomorrah, and all the possessions of, some words missing here, and then says, all that they found there, while Lot, the son of Abram's brother, who was living in Sodom together with them, along with all his flocks, was taken captive. But one of the shepherds of the flock that Abram was given to Lot, who had escaped from the captors, came to Abram. That reminds me of Book of Job, where one of the, one of the people always survives and comes to report it. Now at that time, Abram was living in Hebron, and he informed him that his brother's son Lot had been captured along with all of his property, but that he had not been killed. Also that the kings had set out the way of the great valley toward their province, taking captives, plundering, destroying, killing, and heading for the city Damascus. Then Abram wept over his brother's son Lot. Having collected himself, Abram got up and chose from his servants 318 choice warriors fit for battle. Arnim, Eshkol, and Mamur also set out with him. He chased after them until he reached Dan, where he found them in cam uh, camping in the valley of Dan. He swooped upon them at night from all four directions, killing among them throughout the night. He crushed them and chased after them, and all of them were fleeing before him until they reached Hebron, which is situated in the north of Damascus. He took away from them everyone they had captured, and all that they had plundered, and all of their own goods. Lot, his brother's son, he also saved along with his property. All those whom they had taken captive he brought back. When the king of Sodom heard that Abram had brought back all of the captives and all of the plunder, 
he went up to meet him. He came to Salem, which is Jerusalem, and Abram encamped in the valley of Sheva, which is the valley of the king, the valley of Bet Hakarim. We'll stop for a second. It mentioned Jerusalem by name, so either that's a scribal addition, or the name of Jerusalem may have already been known at that time. The book of Jubilees mentions Jerusalem by name. Uh, so that's an interesting thing there that I think is important. Then it continues, and now it goes with the Melchizedek story. And of all the speculation about Melchizedek, you would think if Melchizedek was a very special person, like, you know, as some think a divine epiphany or a divine appearance or whatever, that there would be an explanation in Abram's book. But all Abraham says is basically what Genesis says. He's just a regular dude that is a high priest. And so it says, And Melchizedek, the king of Salem, brought out food and drink for Abram and for all the men who were with him. He was the priest of the Most High God, and he blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by the Most High God, the Lord of heaven and earth, and blessed be the Most High God, who delivered those who hate you into your hand. So he gave him a tenth of all the property of the king of Elam and his allies. Now, in the Genesis, I'm pretty sure it has the, the divine name there, Yahuwah. But in here, it doesn't have a divine name. It just says the Lord of heaven and earth. And uh, from my understanding of Hebrew, you can't say Yahuwah of heaven and earth. Uh, it's my understanding that that's a grammatically uh, not possible. Um, now, so that's an indication that the scribes may have added Yahuwah into the text. And we've discussed how there... The, the other night we discussed that that happened... Either that happened in the Septuagint version of Genesis, or the scribes were removing the name sometimes. Uh, but in either case, like there's, uh, there's many other examples where we see the divine name sometimes added and sometimes removed. So it seems to me that uh, the divine name was not originally in uh, Genesis, and that it was added by scribes, or perhaps Moses added it for some reason. And... Um, uh, things to support this is in Exodus chapter 6 it says by my name Yahuwah I was not known to Abraham Isaac and Jacob I was known to them as El Shaddai and usually they translate it as God Almighty and but so it shows us that according to Exodus we're being told the name of Yahuwah was not there they did not know they did not uh, they did not know him by that name uh, but our copies of Genesis make it sound like uh, they did because there's sometimes sometimes it's being put into their mouth the name Yahuwah. We actually see this happening with like people who make Hebraic versions of Enoch and stuff. They're adding the divine name into it on an assumption. Whenever they see Lord, they're putting Yahuwah in, and that could be something that the, some of the ancient scribes were doing too. Another thing in this favor that the divine name only came in the time of Moses is when you see like in Enoch, you see the names of all the angels. Not once you're going to see like Yah as part of the ending. You're always going to see El uh, for the names of the Watchers. You would think that if the name Yahuwah was there already, it was known to the angels, they would have been given the name reflecting that divine ending that we see happens later on in, in the Tanakh, uh, like Zechariah, Jeremiah, you know, it has the Yah ending to reflect the divine name but we don't see that in the watchers in Enoch's account so that is strong evidence to me that divine name was not known originally by anyone before the time of Moses let's see okay so then continuing then the king of wait so he gave him a tenth of all the property of the king of Elam or Elam and his allies. Then the king of Sodom drew near and said to Abram, My lord Abram, give me anyone who belongs to me of the captives with you, whom you have rescued from the king of Elam. But as for all the property, it is left to you. Then Abram said to the king of Sodom, I lift up my hands this day to the most high God, the Lord of heaven and earth, that I will, that I will take neither string nor sandal strap from all that which belongs to you lest you should say all the wealth of abram is from my portion or from my property 
exclu- excepting that which my young men who are with me have already eaten, and also the portion of the three men who went with me. They have authority to give you their portions. So Abram returned all, all of the property and all of the captives and gave to the king of Sodom. And every one, excuse me, every one of the captives who were with him from that land he set free and sent all of them away. After these things, God appeared to Abraham in a vision and said to him, Look, ten years have elapsed since the day you have came, that, that, since the day you came out of Haran. Two years you spent here, seven in Egypt, and one since you returned from Egypt. These are all details Jubilees com- confirms, and Genesis doesn't have any hint to it. Now inspect and count all that you have. See that by doubling they have increased greatly, beyond all that came out with you on the day of your departure from Haran. And now do not fear. I am, I am with you and will be for you a support and strength. I am a shield over you and a buckler for you against those stronger than you. Your wealth and your property will increase enormously. Abram said, My Lord God, I have wealth and property in great abundance. Yet what are all these things to me while I, when I die, will go stripped bare without children? One of my household servants will receive my inheritance, Eliezer, son of Damascus. He, like a word's missing, the one acquiring an inheritance from me. But he said to him, This one will not receive your inheritance, but one who will go forth, and it breaks off there, and the rest of the text is now lost. Uh, that's where the Genesis Apocrypha ends. According to the, the scholars, apparently it was cut off at that part. So the, the scroll would have gone on, but someone cut it off either in ancient times or maybe modern times because they wanted to sell it separately as a separate scroll, maybe. And maybe it's out there somewhere. Who knows, though? Um, so as I, as I said, I wanted to do the Abraham section first because that was the most, the, the text was least broken. So now we've been doing this for 40 minutes, uh, 42 to be exact. Would you guys be interested in me going through the Noah portion as well? Uh, the, the time is 8.40. Jackson starts this thing at 9. At 9. Okay. Want me to go for a little bit longer, but I won't go as in detail? Or? Yeah, we can do no. I'm, I'm pretty interested in all that, but it's going to take 10 minutes to get up to the top of the mountain. True. Okay, so I'll just say this, that... Uh, uh, I've, I've done this, uh, I've done these, uh, I've done the Genesis Apocrypha on YouTube, so you can see that, or you can also just uh, read the PDF file yourself and look at it, there's some really interesting stuff. Uh, the, what's interesting is in the Noah scroll, or the, the book of Noah that was found, it has, it has a much fuller version of what Genesis has, like Genesis chapter, chapter 6, and six through eight, let's say, six through eight in the Noah scroll is significantly longer, much longer. Uh, more conversations that are not even hinted at here, and the conversations that do parallel here are much longer. So we can see that the dialogue was condensed significantly. And one of the most important thing that was found, other than the correspondence between Jubilees and Book of Noah, is in fact that. Uh, it's the dream that Noah had. Our, our text makes really no sense in Genesis, where it says uh, Noah became drunk, and then he fell asleep, and then he woke up knowing what happened to him, and, and Ham was the one who did something wrong, but then he curses Canaan instead. And there's no explanation for it. It's a really weird passage. Uh, scholars, I think scholars criticize it a lot. Uh, and, but according to the book of Noah, he has a dream during this time. And first of all, he wasn't drunk in actuality. He was, he was righteous in what he did. He was not a drunkard, you know, like a, he didn't sin in drinking wine. But even drinking some wine is going to make you tired. And for example, it says he, was, he, was, he went asleep naked. It's not a sin to sleep naked. So the, the, the way that people present this story doesn't, uh, it seems like they'd read into it, and in Genesis it translates it as drunk, 
uh, but that same Hebrew word is found elsewhere in, like, so in the King James Version and in other translations too. In other places, that same Hebrew word, they translate it like, and they were merry. Why are they translating it differently? It's because the translators are like, oh, they weren't drunk. We don't want them to think that. So they're picking and choosing how they want to translate it. If it doesn't have to mean drunk, then we shouldn't assume it means drunk necessarily. We should give the benefit of the doubt to Abraham, I think. I mean, Noah, excuse me. And in the, uh, in the, the Clementine, the Nazarene Acts thing, it actually specifically states that, uh, that Noah did, was not a drunkard, and that's a corruption of scripture. That's not true, and that was at, that corruption was added into scripture. That's what Peter says. Uh, so, that uh, that uh, what Peter says supports the Genesis Apocryphon, and basically this dream that he has, he's basically told everything. It, it, he, he dreams of trees. Uh, he's a tree, and the, there's like branches, and the branches break off, and uh, one of the branches is Ham, and it goes into land that it's not supposed to. Uh, it basically, excuse me, it's Canaan. Excuse me. Uh, one of the one of the sprouts is Canaan. It represents Canaan, and it's basically telling him by prophecy that Canaan is going to follow in the footsteps of Ham and violate the oaths and bring curse upon himself. And so, and then he also sees like prophetic dream vision, an apocalypse basically of of what's going to happen and judgment upon nations, things like that. But the dream is very fragmentary. But enough is preserved to give us a basic understanding of what that dream essentially said. And so that explains how Noah knew all this uh, uh, information and why he cursed Canaan uh, and not Ham. And uh, so unfortunately, the rest of those documents are missing. Again, as I said, there was also a book of Lamech, uh, but I'm not going to discuss that today. But basically, I believe, as a scribe, my work is to try to reconstruct the scriptures that we have in the regular books of the Bible, the Tanakh. And also, I believe we can try to do that uh, with some of these other books. So for Lamech, Noah, and Abraham, I believe we can use Jubilees and uh, Genesis. And it, sometimes there's some extra stories in the New Testament or other extra books about Noah or Abraham that's not in our... Uh, that's not in our versions of Genesis or Jubilees. So we can use all these sources to reconstruct a basic idea of what the books of Abraham, books of Noah, said. It's not going to be an exact account, so it's gonna, there's going to be a disclaimer saying this is a reconstruction, but it's going to be an attempt to try to show us, using what we have, all the sources, the fragments found, the best we can have of what the original books of Noah and Abraham probably looked like. Mm -hmm. And the, the book of Noah, we actually have the basic size of the book of Noah preserved in this apocryphon. So that's another key to re reconstruct it. Did either the books of Noah or the books of Lamech go into much detail on the Watchers or Nephilim or anything like that? The book of Lamech uh, went into some greater detail but that's very fragmentary, but there are some important and interesting uh, additions there. And what it does have in Lamech is uh, it, has, it has the same story as Enoch chapters 106 to 107, but like eight times longer or ten times longer the size, a much longer version. Anyways, that's the Genesis Apocryphon. I wasn't able to read the whole thing. I, I wasn't expecting to. But that's uh, a basic preview of it. Hopefully you guys found that interesting. And I, I have it on my website so you can download a PDF file and check it out for yourself. Thank you.